ESPN Radio. It's first and last. Robert Lundberg, Mike Goley Jr. here with you this morning. The Cavs have lost three in a row for the last five. Sick burn, Robin. And listen, if we're looking on the bright side right now, 2017, the Cavs go on the road, hold somebody under 100 points. So baby steps forward towards actually being a competent defensive basketball team again. You know, there, there's two things here at play um, that, that are competing. One is I have a rule of thumb, which is don't trust March NBA results at all because there are so many different factors that come into play. You have guys playing for their next contract. You have guys playing to make a team. You have guys resting. You have guys, you know, not worried about the, the, the seating as much. You have teams that, that are trying to increase their seating. There's just uh, so many different variables at play. With that said, at this moment, the Cavs stink. And you, you wonder how much of it is real versus how much is a mirage. And, and if you're looking for the reasons that are real, well, they haven't been a very good defensive basketball team all season. They haven't been putrid like they've been since the All-Star break, but they haven't been very good all season. And some of the acquisitions they've made, even if you're counting Kevin Love as an acquisition, right, coming back, Kevin Love, Darren Williams, Kyle Korver, those are slow-footed guys in general. So uh, the team's speed did not get better. And then, yes, they lost it in that first year, but they went to the finals. So they're on the third year, and teams that, that make it to the finals two or three years in a row, you usually start to see it, it eventually show itself in attrition. Yeah, and that seems to be what's catching up, and that seems to be the common criticism is uh, that lack of team speed. But you're right, even just in this stretch, even in this – Really bad. I mean, we talked about for LeBron how bad the month of January was. Their 6-10 and 10 record in the month of March is the second worst month in LeBron James' career. It's the second month of his career where he's had double-digit losses. The only other month was his first full month in the NBA as a rookie with the Cavs. And uh, But something worth noting, I think, of this stretch is that the Cavs also played 12 road games in March, which is the most in a single month in franchise history. So there are, like you said, a lot of those factors that start to add up and can give you reasons why this goes south in such a hurry. And they have the, the one true wild card, or, or basically the queen on the, the chessboard, that being LeBron, right? When zero dark 30 mode, or whatever he calls it, is activated, does that just change things? Because without that, they, of course they stand no chance. I mean, it's one of the things that's, that's very interesting, evaluating guys like Kevin Love and, and Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving is one of the best scorers in the NBA, and, and a delight to watch at times, but neither one of those guys has accomplished anything, right? When, when we start talking about him playing with Hall of Famers and All-Stars and that. Those guys obviously have been All-Stars, and, and Kyrie hit the, the shot that wound up deciding the finals a year ago. But if we're just looking at their careers in isolation, I mean, neither of those guys went to the playoffs at all before LeBron. We've seen the Cavs when LeBron doesn't play, so it is that simple. It is that is LeBron able to elevate the rest of that roster to the point where they're back to being championship caliber because when they're all clicking as cogs in the machine, they are. But under so understanding the flaws that exist for this team now that irregardless of the circumstances of this month that you mentioned, there are very clear things you can point to as you have that are season-long issues for the Cavs. Would you be more comfortable in saying that the Cavs are more likely to defend their title and win the NBA championship this year or get knocked out before the finals? Whew. That's a good question. You know what? That's a really good question. 888-729-3776. 888-SAY-ESPN. We'll even make it straight talk. It's such a good question because I'm composing myself as I try to think of the answer. Brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, half the cost. The Cavs more likely to be bounced before the finals or repeat as NBA champions. Straight Talk Wireless nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable network. I think it's very close. You know, before I, I figure out what my definitive answer on that is, I want to reference a piece by uh, Chris Herring, who uh, works for us in, in 538, which is going to be a, a tremendous case study. He wrote about the Cavs, and, and this is before the, the loss of the Bulls last night, but the model that they have, the predictive model that they have, gives the Cavs only a 2% chance to win the NBA championship. Now, that's based on regular season data. Like, that doesn't factor in, hey, they're going to hit this switch, or hey, LeBron playoff mode. So, to me, that's going to be a, a fascinating case study on how much the NBA regular season data 
actually matters and, and how much it serves as a predictive model. Because we hear 2%. That seems ridiculously low. Like, if you gave me 15 20% the way they're playing, okay, I can accept that as the low end of, of the, the spectrum. But 2%? Especially, you're right, because so much of the talk when you have such long regular seasons is some of the postseason models that do a poor job of producing the best champion kind of go away from, we we ignore what we've seen all season and we rely on a postseason tournament type setting to tell us who the best overall team was. And so that is, that's a, a clear as indicator as any is, okay, we understand who the best was during this time period, does that matter, or is it really a completely different season? Is it really uh, something that's so separate that, unfortunately, we can rate the NBA regular season even lower than we already do as far as these things go? Yeah, we'll see what they can do in the, in the postseason. Post-game last night, LeBron James talked about the spot they're in. It's in the basketball right now. Not disappointed with the effort. Um, just in the bad spot. Got to try to figure it out. And, and, you know, how bad the, the spot is is up for interpretation, I guess. They're now a half game behind Boston. So all of this can be rendered moot if they, they do just go and waltz through the, the Eastern Conference. But um, we, we sort of discussed this, right? Just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it's not going to. And, and with LeBron, there's a lot of contextual factors about the East. I don't know. Some people give that Pistons team he had to go through early in his career enough credit. but And, and Boston later. All that stuff being said, there's a reason nobody's been to six straight finals since Bill Russell and company. So seven straight, as much as we treat it like a given, it it really isn't. Yep, exactly. Eventually those tickets to the show get sent back our way. Now, it'll be interesting, and I heard Brian Windhorst bring this up, and and, you know Brian Windhorst, the original LeBron James boo, no disrespect to you, Robin, Mm -hmm. uh, came out and made a very good point, which is that now if you're looking for a time for the Cavs to remedy some of these woes and potentially get back to just playing better basketball, this three-game home stretch that they've got coming up is probably the place to do it. At home versus Philly, Indiana, and Orlando. Three teams that give you a pretty decent chance of going out there on your home court and getting back on track and erasing some of these ills before you are back out at Boston, Atlanta, Miami, and some teams that are going to be a little more trouble that are going to be the playoff teams you see in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, and regardless of where they're at seating-wise and even regardless of how they're playing, if I'm Ty Lue, and we'll hear from him coming up in a second, I am sitting these guys... Tristan Thompson included, um, because he's important to their defense and what they do. Uh, J.R. Smith, we know, has some personal issues going on, so that, that could factor in. But I'm getting those guys a clean slate physically and mentally before the playoffs, and that's even at the expense of the number one seed. First and last on ESPN Radio. I said before the break, if I was Ty Lu, I would – ensure that my team got some rest before the postseason, even if it cost me the number one seed. After the game last night, he talked about the things they need to address just regarding their play. Well, I mean, when you lose, you know, I guess, uh, what, you know, five or seven, I mean, of course we know we got some things to address. You know, we got to get better offensively now. We play a good game of defense, then we can't score the basketball. So, um, you know, he's frustrated, and, you know, so are we. You know, we just got to figure out ways to get it better and make it better. Um, defensively tonight was a step in the right direction, but now offensively we gotta we gotta play better, moving the basketball, trusting, and also playing with more pace. So all really kind of obvious things that all of these guys already know at this point. It just it has to go out there and get executed. It has to get accomplished. And at this point, I, I know you talked about rest and the seating really shouldn't matter at this point to them. They understand what they're capable of when they are playing at the level they're accustomed to. But it, I think it is there's just something mentally about going out there and just getting it done one or two more times, of feeling like you're closer to your normal self going into that before you shut it down because there's nothing worse than dealing with uncertainty, like going into a break with uncertainty. And that's true in almost any circumstance. And like, if, you're, if you've got any sort of off time coming up, you want to go out in a high note so you can feel good during that time. You can go about your business without that anxiety of, on the back end, are we really going to be able to, like you said, flip the switch and just be on? No, I would much rather see it happen a couple of times so I can know going into it, all right, I can go back and look on tape. If I want to see something, I've got tape of me doing it recently the way I want to when it's going to come down to it when the things start to get real here in the playoffs. And when we talk about the Eastern Conference, everybody's like, okay, what's the team that's going to do it? And maybe 
there isn't the one team you point to, but this year there are three teams that are good. You know, there it's it could be having to face Toronto and or Washington and Boston in consecutive series or something along those lines because Washington has a lot of talent. Um, I think people are sleeping a little bit on, on the kind of talent. As far as the personnel, I think they may be the biggest threat. Though I could give a nod to Toronto if they give uh, get Kyle Lowry back healthy and with the acquisition of Ibaka and Tucker. Boston's just really well coached. They, they defend really well. They've got Avery Bradley who can go out on a Kyrie Irving. So th- these teams are, are not... The Warriors or the the Spurs over the course of the regular season, of course, none of them have hit 50 wins yet, but they're all pretty darn good. It's it's a grab bag, basically, in the Eastern Conference right now. You've got your known commodities out there in the West, the team that not only we know are going to be good in that, but could be legitimate title contenders in the West. And then the Eastern Conference, you're right, you've got a grab bag of all things that could improve their stock in the playoffs. Sort of the way Toronto did, I mean, their real coming out party felt like it was the playoffs last year where they really pushed the Cavs to their limit and showed well for themselves in that regard with a young nucleus. So that's a team you have to worry about. But you mentioned Washington or, uh, the Wizards. They're capable of stepping up, I think, in a similar sense. They're one of those teams is going to elevate their play enough to become a problem for someone in the Eastern Conference. And the Cavs are the ones sitting at the top of the hill, so that becomes their problem. The Cavs lost again last night, if you missed it, to the Chicago Bulls. How about this for a quirky stat? The Bulls have won 20 straight Home regular season games went on TNT. That I was waiting for. I was the the beginning part was okay. Went on TNT. That made it a little more interesting because I was just marveling at the fact that they completed the season sweep against the Cavs. Went four and zero against them this year. So there's a, a lot of weird things like that coming in line for a Bulls team that's battling for that eighth seed in the playoffs. Uh oh, four and zero against the Cavs in the regular season. One game out of the eighth seed. Cavs still just a half game back. Of the one seed, could it happen in the first round? I mean, to to quote the great Stu Gotts, Cavs, Bulls, collision course. <laughs> I talked about rest. Someone else did as well. Um, it's a topic that, that doesn't get a rest, and that was Kevin Durant with ESPN's Chris Haynes. Here's what he had to say. The truth about it is it's only for a couple players in the league, right? Mm-hmm. They don't care if the 13th man on the bench rests for the game, right? It's only like a draw standard it's only for like five players, so you want to rule just for those five players. Um, I understand when the fans say that they're buying tickets and they're not seeing their favorite players play. Well, other than there's a lot of people that can't afford tickets to the game. Um, so um, I kind of feel sorry for you, but I don't when I look at it that way. Well, I mean, obviously he's right that it's only a few players people care about, but that, that's part of the allure of, of the NBA. One thing I noticed there is he said five players, and he named them. He said LeBron, Steph, Russ, Harden, and then nobody else. So I'm assuming he was number five. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but we were playing a rap song, and there's lots of subliminal disses in rap. He didn't mention Kawhi Leonard, and Kevin Durant has a habit with Kawhi Leonard to try and undermine him a little bit. He called him a system player in the past, and he leaves him out of that conversation there when it, when it comes to the rest, when the Spurs are notorious for resting players. I, I don't know if that was a, a slip or an accident or, or done on purpose. You know what he did? He pleaded, though. He, he quite literally went one, two, three, four, fifth. Pleaded the fifth on that one. The omission simultaneously. Comp- I didn't even think about the Kawhi diss in there. I just assumed it was Kevin Durant subtly placing himself in that group, which I don't have a problem with. He's in that group when you mention the other two. Between Russ and Harden, now one of them's going to get it this year, but KD's the only MVP in that portion of the group besides LeBron and Steph. Very comfortable with that, but you better start putting respect on Kawhi's name real quick because the claw will come out. That, that man's been on a mission, and he's partially my favorite in a lot of this because he's that silent deadpan killer, and he's one that's gotten consistently I mean, because Kawhi Leonard's a guy that – you look at his trajectory right now and the way he's improved each and every year, I would not be shocked if that's a guy that when LeBron James' skill set finally does diminish and he's re- and he's forced to relinquish that crown, we could be talking about Kawhi Leonard as the best player in the world. Well, you know, you talk about Durant and, and Leonard. I promise you this, if we're, we're using LeBron as sort of a, a measuring stick, LeBron prefers to play against Kevin Durant than he does Kawhi Leonard. I mean, we've seen him 
visually go, oh, man, when Kawhi Leonard is checked back into a game while standing near the free throw line. Uh, Kawhi, uh, Kawhi's, Kawhi is everything you hate about playing against someone because he's going to be unbelievably steadfast in his approach. He's going to be remarkably consistent. He's going to give you crazy effort. And, oh, by the way, he's one of the most physically gifted and skilled players in the league that gets undersold when you're an effort guy, when you're a do-everything-the-right-way guy the way he is, and then he's just going to stare at you while he does it. He's not going to taunt you. He's not going to mock you. He's just going to stare at you with that wee beady look in his eyes, and it's going to slowly break down your psyche and your soul. I've got some tweets coming in on the 1-800-Flowers Twitter feed, and I think this is a good barometer of where people are on, on opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to the Cavs. Kuno Sports Talk 19 tweets in, I don't think the Cavs get past the second round at this point, but Jean-Claude Hubbard says... No matter how bad it looks now, all it takes is playoff LeBron sweeping a first-round series to change the narrative. So there you go right there. Yeah, we should see how quickly the Cavs are going to break all of our necks turning this one around. Because you know it's more than likely going to come. It can drop on a dime in the NBA, and all it'll be is us talking again about how the Cavs are the favorite in the Eastern Conference and probably to defend their title. So uh, I think it's going to be very interesting. And and one thing about, you know, aside from the other guys, who are, are maybe tired and, and coming back from injury and, and working their way in. And, and, and I mentioned before, um, I hope everything's cool with J.R. Smith's family, but dealing with, with other stuff as well. LeBron, whether it's conscious or subconscious, has done this so many times. He might tell you, he might even try to convince himself that all this matters right now. But we've seen this sort of pattern from him, and it's impossible to lie to yourself in that sense from what you actually know when it's go time. It's fine for him to believe that. He just has to make sure that some of his teammates don't start believing that because they don't have that clout. First and last on ESPN Radio. Well, um, Cam Newton had surgery, uh, and it went well. As all the surgeons always say right after the surgery, they say that, that it went well. I've never really heard. That was a disaster. But um, doctor pleased after Cam Newton's rotator cuff surgery. Now, to, to take this a step further, it's just really an entry point into a Cam Newton discussion. And the Cam Newton discussion becomes about you know where he is right now. Is his health going to be a factor going forward? But Jordan Rogers, who does a show on Sunday night here on ESPN Radio, said that Cam Newton, he's also an SEC network analyst, isn't a top 10 quarterback currently and gave his reasons. What do you need to build an offense around somebody? What do you need to have consistency? you got to be able to get through your progressions and complete balls. I don't care what offense you run. You get to your third and fourth progression, you get the ball out of your hands, and you allow your play caller – to now actually have a game plan and build upon consistency. And I think at times, Cam is one of the best on the planet, and too many times I think he's a reason that there's somewhat of a ceiling in the locker room and on the field. A couple of things. You're right, it is interesting how quickly we've gotten away from this point with Cam after the way last year went for them. And to be fair, the standard coming off of that was his MVP season before where he had done everything for that team. Some of those complaints, and listen, Jordan's a former quarterback. I'm sure he's a guy that you know is, is hopefully you know, does his homework in a lot of this, so he's going to have his reasons. But some of those things are like familiar tropes that we hear lobbed at black quarterbacks all the time. The stuff about progressions and reads and all of these different things. Cam Newton was a guy that buoyed that team when there was nothing there. When that team got back last year, we knew they were getting Kelvin Benjamin back, so we figured that offense would get better. And a funny thing happened where Kelvin Benjamin came back and wasn't quite the same dude he was before that injury and ended up not helping that offense a lot of the same ways. You couple that with the fact that Cam Newton... We saw there's a legitimate officiating questions around him. That team was playing their all pro right guard or uh, all pro guard Trey Turner at tackle. They had that kind of issues at tackle last year, and just in general, that wasn't the same team. Even as diminished as it was in certain skill spots around him, his MVP year last year was even more so. So wasn't really getting a lot of help, and I wonder now going forward because there's questions about his what they're going to do with him coming off of this injury because Cam Newton was used in a way no one else in the NFL can be used 
in offense as a part of the run game as a quarterback. Are they going to do right by him? Is the league going to do right by him officiating-wise? And are they going to maximize their window and maximize the health and preservation of their key asset there in Carolina when it's all said and done? Like Cam Newton, to me, seems like the poster child for one of those quarterbacks we're going to talk about as an all-time great skill set, one of the great quarterbacks in our league, never to win a title. That's a lot of quarterbacks I, I guess you can you can put on, but um, we sort of associate how you perform as a quarterback with how great you are when it, when it comes to accomplishments and, and, of course, championships. It does feel to me like a lot of people were just waiting, waiting for anything to say that Cam Newton wasn't as good as he was praised as in his MVP year. Like I saw uh, Jordan Rogers' list, and, and Kirk Cousins is on it before – Cam Newton. You mentioned it, reads and progressions. It's not a read and progression contest, right? The, the position is not even designated thrower. It's quarterback. And when you talk about Cam Newton's MVP season, I get it. Last year wasn't great. But what was around him? I don't know if there's anybody, period, that could have gotten that team where they went that year, including Tom Brady. Not to say that Cam Newton is better than Tom Brady, but as far as what he's able to do to elevate an entire team as an individual, you swap Cam Newton out from that team two years ago and you put literally any player in his place, I don't think Carolina goes to the Super Bowl. No, Cam, Cam Newton is the like definitively the most unique quarterback skill set in the NFL. We talk about Aaron Rodgers last year as the best quarterback skill set we've ever seen, and I'm fine with that. But if you're looking for two on that list as far as gifts at the quarterback spot, that's Cam Newton. And you couple that with his willingness to do certain things in the run game that only he can do because of the combination of his size and strength. And that's important. That's an off, that's an off speed pitch that almost no one else has. That's going to have to be used less now. Now he ran, I think uh, I, I heard someone mention this yesterday, a career low 90 rushing attempts last year as a combination of some of those other things. And they're going to have to protect him more. But that's a part of his game that no one else has, that no one else can do in that way. And then on the other end, it's what do they want to accomplish in that offense? Because we can talk about reads and progressions, but that's an offense that thrives in boom or bust. They wanted to, with Ted Ginn there, who's now gone, by the way, push the ball down the field, use those home home run hits. Their second best offensive weapon at receiver was probably their tight end in Greg Olson. So they wanted to exploit the middle of the field with him. Other than that, they didn't have a lot of guys that I think operated in some of those in between in between roles. Now if they bring guys like that in and want to morph the offense in that way, especially post using Cam Newton as a battering ram on a lot of their possessions, then be my guest. But right now he should be judged off what he's been asked to do. Yeah, the, the unique skill set for him could be a bit of a, a curse because, therefore, they're relying on him to do more than, than any other player would be relied upon to do. And when you talk about rushing attempts, not all rushing attempts are created equal. I mean, his he is a, a harder runner than any quarterback I've ever seen, meaning between the tackles and moving the chains and all that oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, you're, you're not running power with any other quarterback in this league but Cam Newton. In addition to taking the hits that you talked about when it comes to the officiating. And all this talk about the NBA rest argument – that's because, you know, basketball mileage wears on you. But it ain't nothing compared to football. And that's the concern, I think, with Cam Newton. As much of a physical freak as he may be, it doesn't matter. There's never been a physical freak who isn't eventually worn down by the accumulative, you know, punishment that you take playing in the NFL. And having the rotator cuff surgery, he, had, he was injured, if you remember, two years ago. Not his MVP season, but he dealt with a, a bevy of injuries two years prior to that. When does that take its toll to the point where it slows him down? Yep, and, and now so now you have to look at, you're right, uh, it's those injuries taking their toll. So you, can, you can't control the way the league officiates the hits on Cam that came in the pocket, but you can control those rushing hits, and they're going to have to take some of those off him. So what's that mean? The ca- them getting back to what they did so well in his MVP season, which was control the line of scrimmage. And they went out, signed Matt Khalil, the, the Ryan Khalil, their center's brother, to fill up one of their tackle spots. We'll see if that's a move that's actually you know, a quality enough move to sure up a place that's been an issue for them. And then you look at the running back position. Jonathan Stewart was injured some last year, but he's also 30. He's hit that running back age where we start to go, is this really going to work? And so that's going to be up to be a place that they look at there. Wide receiver with the departure of Ted Ginn Jr., with Kelvin Benjamin underperforming is going to have to be a place they look. And then on defense, 
That's a group that took a drop off last year, too. And if we're going to be honest, the guy I'm most worried about injury wise in that whole team is Luke Keekley. Luke Keekley had that ugly string of concussion related injuries. Scary. Yeah. It, where it, it looks scary, but you also wonder if that's something he can fully recover from and be the guy that we've seen because that defense suffered on the back end. Um, when they let uh, – who was their uh, defensive back from the year before? Uh, Josh Norman. Josh Norman. When they let Josh Norman go in free agency after the whole franchise tag being revoked there, their defensive line, K1 Short, and that group didn't perform to the level of the year before. So you've got a lot of questions on that side that revolve around their centerpiece that worry me a little bit more, that are a little bit tougher to control than managing the hits you can put on Cam Newton. Yeah, Cam's the great equalizer. That's why he's absolutely a top 10 quarterback. I mean, I'd even, you know, go as far as saying he's one of the very best players in the NFL. When his other skills diminish, is he still a top 10 quarterback as the prototypical kind of quarterback? No, I don't think that. But when he's healthy and he's in there, he makes more of an impact than almost anybody else in the entire NFL. And we're not that far removed from him being the MVP. I mean, how it didn't take much counter evidence for some people. No, it, it didn't. Now, that being said, the, the argument against a lot of people putting him in, like you said, that top five range is going to be doing it over multiple seasons. So this is going to be a big year as far as the way that conversation goes. But on his best day, we know what Cam's capable of. It's so special. It's so unique. Now we just need to see it more often, and we need to see if this team is going to be committed enough to keeping him upright and able to do that. First and last on ESPN Radio. A lot of stuff going on this weekend. You got the Final Four. You got baseball opening day. You got WrestleMania. So it's a a pretty big um, and hearty weekend. But when it comes to the Final Four, we've wound up discussing various things throughout this tournament, and we keep coming back to one stock point. And, And I wonder how much of a point it actually is. How important is it for North Carolina to be one of the teams in the final? Yeah, we had the we had the ratings discussion. That's really where this came up. Is that the tournament overall has rated very well. It's an improvement over last year, but we know the marquee game that everyone's pointed to so far was North Carolina, Kentucky. Two Absolutely. of the all time college basketball blue bloods did something like fifteen million viewers overnight for that game. Was a huge success. Was every bit of the game that people wanted out of that. But now with the rest of the Relative unknowns in the situation. We mentioned that Roy Williams is the savvy veteran in, in this case, but then you've got a bunch of coaches making their first Final Four appearances here in, in Oregon, Gonzaga, and the last team in this Final Four that escapes my name because that's South how Carolina. nondescript it is, of course, the reason for the, the Darius Carolina. Rucker bump back right there. Ironically enough, South Carolina, the only team in the tournament with both their men's and women's teams represented in the Final Four, but that's what I mean. So is... The success now from here on out, because we've got the Final Four set, is the success of the national championship game. When the sole focus is on one game in the universe of your sport, do we need North Carolina for it to be a success? I feel I feel like the answer is yes. I feel like if you want to have that national attention really closed in on that game, you have sort of what we got for the Super Bowl, but I think a little more of the extent, because Atlanta was a really good known commodity coming off the season by that point. Like enough people had seen them in the playoffs to where we were picking Atlanta in a lot of cases, but it was still David versus Goliath to an extent. That's what you can get with North Carolina versus whoever comes out. The counter to that is North Carolina, Kentucky, I think works so well because there were two of them. You know, two programs, obviously guys who are going to go play in the pros and all that. But there isn't a star. It's not like we're, we're dealing with that Kentucky team from a few years ago where I don't think it mattered who they played as long as they were around. Now, they, they wound up playing a Wisconsin team that produced some NBA players and the like, but with North Carolina, does it feel as much as David and Goliath or whatever other you know analogy you want to draw, regardless of who they play? I mean, I, I get it. that they, they are going to bring more eyeballs in. I, I totally agree with that. But I don't, I don't think there's any combination other than it being the championship game and that naturally – elevating the viewership, I don't think there's any combination that equals North Carolina and Kentucky and what they brought together um, as the sum being even greater than the the individual part. No, we said it then. I think we probably saw the best game that the tournament had left to offer at that point, at least by interest and all that standards. Now, this is a continued discredit to Gonzaga, who could be the team that North Carolina faces coming off this. North Carolina faced off against Oregon, Gonzaga, South Carolina – on the other side, and Gonzaga is the team that's been slighted all along. That even now in the tournament, 
uh, I hasn't, hasn't played and won't play a top three seed in the tournament until they theoretically get to the title game and have to play Oregon or North Carolina. So, but this could be, you know, just does Mark Few in that group get over the hump against someone like North Carolina, the established power versus a team that's habitually fallen short throughout their time in the tournament. So I think that's, and then South Carolina is the, the resident Cinderella of the group, the one that has fought their way. They've got the coach in Frank Martin, who's become sort of the beloved coach left in this tournament. He's got you know all the stories about him from his days as a bouncer in Miami and has made waves as great moments with SI Max and, and kids along the way through the tournament. So I, I think that's the storylines you have to root for at this point, and it all works better with Carolina as the foil. North Carolina versus South Carolina sounds cool, right? Oh, oh, the Carolinas are going at it. But beyond that, I don't think there's much there. I I think you're right about Gonzaga. Gonzaga has at least become, if they're not a a powerhouse program of the likes of North Carolina and Kentucky, they're a program that everybody knows. They are now a a nationally recognized. You you don't go to your bracket and go, oh, who's Gonzaga? Or, you know, I don't know, you know, this pesky 12 seed Gonzaga. They're they're not that anymore. They are are now one of the the powerhouses as far as being in there on an annual basis. Yeah, everyone's on notice now. They're not going to sneak up on you, but the question is, is are they still respected enough to where... Because that would be a one versus one final, but it wouldn't. It would not have that feel whatsoever. I, I feel like nationally, we would still all look at Gonzaga, and a lot of people would point to, point to East Coast bias and say we're ignoring we're ignoring the body of work they've put together. But just by nature of the accomplishment, especially in a sport like college basketball and college sports in general, where we base so much of our opinions around the identities of these places on the coaches. You've got Roy Williams in North Carolina who now have the record for most Final Four appearances at 20 versus a team in, in, with Mark Few making their first Final Four appearance. Here was his Mark, first Final Four appearance. Here was Mark Few on whether that first Final Four is going to overwhelm his players a little bit. For our guys, I mean, it, you know, this is the, it is a spectacle, and it, it's amazing, and it's hard not to get caught up in that. Uh, so, uh, ironically, I think you look at our team, and there's a lot of experience, but then even going back to that first game against South Dakota State, that was Nigel's first NCAA tournament game. That was Jonathan Williams' first NCAA tournament game. Zach Collins, Killian Tilly, you know, a lot of these guys. So that was Mark Few, uh, and his team finally gets there, right? I, I found it amusing throughout this run a little bit that everyone picks against Gonzaga because they don't believe in them, and even when they get to the Final Four, unfortunately for them, because to get to the Final Four, you have to beat some good teams. I, I just don't see how it can happen otherwise. The bracket fell where there wasn't one team that they vanquished that you point to and go, oh, there there it is. Gonzaga finally proved themselves. Exactly, and listen, I... Certainly, well well versed in that from playing on, from playing on a team that week after week had to try and find a way to justify. Are you for real? That's been the story for Gonzaga all tournament, and it is a difficult prospect to get to this because we talk about all the time. Basketball's Final Four weekend is like a championship. It has that feel for you when you're a player to the point where we're talking about some of these teams arriving early because of injury or players dealing with illnesses. There's that level of media coverage where we're hearing about all these things in a place where we otherwise wouldn't. And it's now finding a way for all of these kids to balance that. And that can be difficult when you are doing that for the first time, going through all just the, the machinations of it and trying to just be where you're supposed to be, deal with the events that sometimes come up at these different things. You've got family ticket requests that are always a, a, a kind of something that can weigh on you if they're new stressors. And that's it, just trying to manage all the new stressors that you've got to where you look over at North Carolina, and you've at least, if you don't have players that have directly been through this time and time again, you've got a coach that can say, all right, guys, this is exactly how this is going to go. Well, every life coach will tell you to live in the moment and, and sort of appreciate and cherish the moment. And that's something you've got to do on a number of factors. One, being that you're appreciating where, you're, where you are and how big an opportunity it is, but also not getting overwhelmed by it. Because who was the kid that intentionally fouled when – they didn't have any uh, fouls to give, and he sent them to the free throw line just at the beginning of this tournament. We, we talked about it. I think we started the show with it. We ended the show with it, and I don't remember, you know, like his, his name. And that's how quickly it happens. Like Frank Martin is another example. Frank Martin right now is in the news, but that's a here today, gone tomorrow if, if that program doesn't sustain. So a, as much as it is a crazy great moment for these kids, I would remind them that unless you're Chris Webber and you're going to be the number one pick in the draft – 
do you the same thing you've been doing because the the worst thing that's going to happen is not going to stick with you even forever. No, it, it's it's true and it feels good to say, but in that moment when you start to have that realization that all the eyes of the sports world are turned on you, it starts to feel a little different and the heat of those lights can get awfully bright awfully quick. It was uh, Matthew Fisher Davis, by the way, of Vanderbilt in that game against Northwestern at the beginning of the tournament. First and last on ESPN Radio. It says for Gojo here. Yeah, no. On my screen. I, I get this one. You know why, Robin? Why is that? Because we're getting ready to talk about the Lowe's Never Stop Improvement mo- Never stop improving. Moment of the week. It you can improve can the read. rest of the read here. I can I mean, improve. So it's like um, performance art. It's very, it's very meta right now. So mm-hmm. we are brought to you by Lowe's, and now through April second at Lowe's, Pro's customer service can save up to fifteen percent on select doors and windows. Visit the Pro Desk or Lowe'sforpros dot com for details. Selection varies by location, U.S. only. And the reason I bring that up outside of the way I butchered it and could only go up from there on, thus being an improvement moment myself, is that the top prospect on everyone's board, superstar Texas A&M defensive end Miles Garrett, went out and, Robin, he improved his 40 time at Texas A&M's Pro Day coming off his stellar performance at the Combine. Let's all give him a round of applause. Miles Garrett going out there reminding us all, look at how fast he can go. Why does this bother you so much? All right, Miles Garrett, as I said, the runaway number one prospect at this point, to the point where everyone's saying if the Browns don't take him at number one, it could actually out-Browns every other Browns move that we've seen in the history of the Browns, at least in recent memory. The Brownsiest moment uh, of the week or, or of uh, of all time, that's that's a, a high bar to hit. Exactly, and so that's that's the level that we were at coming off of the NFL Combine where Miles Garrett was the runaway story at that went out there, looked every bit of the part, tested through the roofs, gave everyone exactly what they wanted to see out of a guy who we already figured was going to fall into that role because of the skill set he demonstrated in college. So, goes out there, and you know what? I get testing at the combine. To double down and do it at your pro day, to me, for a guy that's already secured his bag, to use the parlance of our time, Mm Mm-hmm. Makes absolutely no sense. All you're doing is putting yourself at risk for injury in a drill that already means basically nothing for Miles Garrett. You can turn on any piece of tape from the last three years at Texas A&M and see every bit of that burst that you want to see out of Miles Garrett. For a guy that caliber, and I've never understood that, and that's why I lauded, I think, Laramie Tunsil last year who had his own draft day issues that ended up being his Mm -hmm. demise but really didn't run a 40, didn't do a lot of that stuff because it didn't matter for him, and it doesn't matter for Miles Garrett. I am all for guys at that level, the uber top prospects, bucking the system, bucking those trends because they don't need it. And part of me loves it because it's a, you know, it's a little against the system and owners and GMs and all the teams hate it, but it doesn't matter because they know they're still going to pick this guy at the top end of things. The knock on Miles Garrett is effort. That came up last season for him because he played a lot of the season with a high ankle sprain. And in general, I don't know if he's a guy that you're going to confuse with being a high-motor player the way like a a Derek Barnett from uh, Tennessee will be for a team coming out. But that being said, you can show that off in position drills with all the coaches out there. You can show everyone your effort in all of those drills that aren't going to put you at unnecessary risk for something as stupid as bettering a 40 time. Like, who does who does that help? And I lo- people love competitive nature, and I'm sure scouts are going to slobber all over that and say he wanted to go out there and compete even against himself. To me, it's just dumb because you're one pulled hamstring away from all of a sudden just starting your NFL career on a rocky note because hamstrings can linger. Things, anything that comes out of that can linger, and all of a sudden you're just behind the eight ball for football stuff because at the end of the day, none of these drills matter when you put on tape the things a guy like this has put on. I hate top prospects putting themselves at unnecessary risk like this, and Miles Garrett was just the latest example of that. Now, um, in your your rant there, I noticed you talked about him being labeled as a guy who doesn't have a high motor and, and all that. Do you think that played into this at all, where people are saying he, he's not an effort guy, so in order to show you I'm an effort guy, I'm going to work to improve a 40 time, even though it's not really that important for me? I guess in theory, but to me, once you once you came off that combine, that was basically, that whole performance was his version 
of um of Deion Sanders running into the tunnel after his 40. That was a walk-off type performance for him coming off the combine, where everyone already knew he was the number one overall prospect. There was nothing left to prove for him, and the minuscule bit of maybe pat on the back good that that 40-time improvement does for him is so outweighed by the potential disaster on the other side. And I know a lot of people cry about us being super sensitive coming off a college football season where we saw guys rest in bowl games. But to me, this is so – in a process that's already idiotic in a lot of senses, the pre-draft process where we way overrate some of the things that we see during this time period and it gets a lot of people in trouble with the decisions they make, this is one I just don't understand. Here was Miles Garrett on preparing for the draft and running the 40 to the SEC Network. I'm not satisfied with just doing well or doing good. I want to be great, and that's holding myself to my standards, not anybody else's. You've wrecked havoc against some of the smaller schools, and some of your critics have said, well, why didn't the production come against top-level competition? What's your answer to those critics? I mean, they're great teams. A great team versus another great team. Your your performance is going to go down, but... My my job is to you know improve my consistency. Where you know when I dominate against you know the the lesser teams, go ahead and do well and do the same amount of work. When I'm going against you know the Alabamas and the LSU's, and it'll come. You know they they'll try to scheme against me, and I don't see that they have better guys. It it helps, but I'm trying to show that I can dominate against anybody. Wherever you end up, when your name is called, what is that city and that organization going to get when Miles Garrett becomes a part of it? A guy who's going to come in with you know, relentless worth ethic and somebody who's going to challenge you know, people every day to come and you know, lead because you, know, you, know, you can never have enough leaders on the field. You know what I find intriguing about all this, and it's not specific to Miles Garrett, when it matters what you do at the Combine and when it doesn't. Now, you're talking about him. He's a little bit different because everybody saw what he did in college. But it does seem like for some guys it's not that important. For other guys, they can really elevate their their status a la Vernon Golston, or you're looking for that one thing to to pick them apart. Sometimes you need to run a 40 on the beach for Mark Slareth. You you never know exactly how important all this stuff is. The all-important beach 40 is something I really think they're going to start to bring into the combine. Now, you're going to have to import sand because it's Indianapolis, but we can work around this set of issues. But you're right. And it absolutely, listen, I'll put it this way. I mean, I was an undrafted free agent. I was a guy who knew that going in. So everything I was going to do at my pro day was of the utmost importance because you're just trying to turn heads. If you're someone whose tape wasn't Miles Garrett tape or you're the potential that you flash constantly with that production wasn't Miles Garrett level or the level of a lot of these other top prospects, you're just looking for a reason for people to go back and check you out again. You go to the combine and you post a good 40 time. If you're someone, they're going to go back and say, all right, well, where does this show up on that guy's tape again? I mean, Mike, Mike Mayock used to say You want them to swipe right. Yes, exactly. That's, that's ex- in, a, in, a tinder, in the tinderization of the NFL offseason and the NFL pre-draft process. You're just looking for a team to swipe right on you and read that bio over one more time. Go back and look through the pictures a little bit. See if you've got a good spring break photo in there that maybe they can justify furthering this conversation a little bit. And that's all you really want. And so for some people like me, we're running my 40, hitting my bench time, doing the drills. All those times were going to matter because I just wanted someone to look at me. All of the eyes of the NFL world are already on Miles Garrett coming off of this. And so running some stupid 40 again is doing nothing but unnecessarily putting yourself at risk for the means of what? Proving to people that you want to compete against yourself, which is that quote. That he said right there, all those good things that he said could have easily existed in a world where Miles Garrett didn't run another 40. We talked a lot about rest, right? NBA and blah, 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 blah. Well, in a sense, that's what you're asking him to do. Miles Garrett, the only thing he can do, basically, my read on what you're saying is the only thing he could do by doing anything right now is harm his status. He should basically do nothing and just wait until um, the, the countdown is done. The countdown toward the draft, and then what do they have, 10 minutes now? And, and the 10 minutes for the, the number one team on the clock. Exactly. And that's not even to say, you start to, you know what, go start getting in football shape now. Forget training for the 40 because that's the important piece that right now is starting to happen with a lot of these guys is now you start to get in football shape because you're going to show up and you hear this all the time when you're a kid coming into the league as a rookie when you get there for the rookie mini camp for the first set of workouts is congratulations on getting drafted. Now you're behind because the rest of the team's already been there doing the work in the offseason program. The rest of the team who's already completed their last year in the NFL, for some guys it's their first, for some guys the veteran players, they've been doing this. So you're already behind. So you want to start playing catch-up on that stuff, not worrying about starts, 
not worrying about coming out of your you know your 40 time and the drive phase and all these things. It, it's something that I think for top level prospects, when you're guys that can afford to not do it, I'd like to see more guys exercise that option. And I understand the establishment doesn't like that because they want to be able to measure and scrutinize everything and find ways to get you for cheaper. But if you don't need to do it, I I I hope we're starting to get to a place now where we're seeing the rest on the back end of college. Let's start to see it on the front end for these guys that really don't need the headache. First and last on ESPN Radio.